Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be with you. Uh, I have to tell you that this is one of my favorite lessons, and uh, I'm thrilled to share it with you. Uh, this phrase, like a caged bird, is a very interesting one. It's taken from a six-sided clay tablet. It's called the Taylor Cylinder, after the architect who discovered it. It was discovered in 1830 in the ruins of Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh. And it uh, originally was found in the British Museum, although a few years ago I found out that it's actually being held at the Oriental Institute in Chicago. The Oriental Institute is an archaeological museum, part of the University of Chicago, and I got a chance to see it. Um, it's very small, smaller than I anticipated from the pictures. It's only 15 inches tall and 5 inches wide, but it is one of the most perfect archaeological specimens of its kind ever discovered. And its historical and its particularly its biblical significance is immense. This uh, cylinder contains 487 lines of very legible cuneiform text, and it records eight military expeditions of Sennacherib, who was king of Assyria. And of course, the most important record on this cylinder is his siege against Jerusalem during the reign of King Hezekiah. Archaeologists, archaeologists have actually translated the cuneiform for us and like to read the translation, the center column of this tablet. This is how Sennacherib described the events that he's recording. He said, I fixed upon him and of Hezekiah, king of the Jews, who had not submitted to my yoke, 46 of his fenced cities, and the strongholds and the smaller cities which were round about them, and which were without number, by the battering rams and by the attack of engines, and by the assaults of foot soldiers, and I besieged, I captured 200,150 people, small and great, male and female, horses and mules and asses and camels and men, and sheep innumerable from their midst. I brought out, and I reckoned them as spoil. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird within Jerusalem, his royal city, I shut in. Now, the historical record indicates that Sennacherib really did devastate the land of Israel, because much of what he wrote here in his historical account is confirmed for us in the Bible. In 2 Kings 18.13, it says that he came up against all the fenced cities of Judah, and he took them. And then in verse 17 of that chapter, we read of Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem. But here's an interesting point about the clay cylinder and Sennacherib's account of the siege of Jerusalem. In the last line that we read, notice what Sennacherib said concerning Hezekiah and Jerusalem. He said that Hezekiah, he had like a caged bird within Jerusalem, and that the city was shut in. And you know, that was true. But never does he say what actually took place when he went to battle. Actually, he never did go to battle. He never said that he took the city. And if you weren't knowledgeable of the real history of what happened, you would think that it was implied that he took the city, that Jerusalem fell with all the other cities of Jerusalem. When Sennacherib said that he had Hezekiah like a caged bird, he was really saying that coming against Jerusalem was no big deal. It was... The phrase we might use today was it was like shooting fish in a barrel, that Jerusalem was no problem to the mighty Assyrian army. But it's interesting when you read the scriptural account, we see that what he didn't say was just as important as what he said. In 2 Kings 19, 35 through 37, we read what actually happened. It says, that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. It came about as he was worshipping in the house of Nishroth, his god, that Adramelech and Sherazar killed him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat and Esarhaddon, his son became king in his place. And then when you look at the pages of history, you never again see the nation of Syria, Assyria come against Israel. I thought that the murder of Sennacherib in the very palace where he was worshiping his God was an indictment against his own God. 
that Sennacherib was not safe when he was right in the temple of his own God. And you see a contrast to the safety of Hezekiah, that when Hezekiah was surrounded by an innumerable army, he prayed safely in the temple of God, and he was never And it came to pass that the Assyrians learned that the God of Israel was not someone that they could contend with. So the boasting words of Sennacherib's clay tablet were true. He did have Jerusalem shut in and Hezekiah caged, like a, a cornered like a caged bird. But you can see that Sennacherib wanted history to view the matter in a different light than what actually came to transpire. And so we see in this case that a half-truth is often more deceiving than an outright lie. It took the honesty of the scriptural account uh, to give us the other side of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Well, we're going to get back to that part of the story of Hezekiah and look at the siege of Jerusalem in more depth. But before we do that, I'd like to examine the atmosphere that surrounded Hezekiah as he was growing up. I don't think that we could possibly appreciate what an amazing king he was until we understand the negative influences in his youth. We know that Hezekiah's father was King Ahaz. In 2 Chronicles 28, 1 through 4, we're told that Ahaz had made graven images and that he burned incense to Balaam. He was the first king of Judah to burn some of his own children in fire as a sacrifice to heathen gods. Because of the wickedness of Ahaz, Israel was constantly plagued by invasions and wars. In 2 Chronicles 28, 19, we're told of, of the effect that Ahaz had on the people of Israel. It says, For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. And he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. Ahaz made Judah sore, naked, by stripping of, of its true worship and service of God. And of course, the result was that God refused to protect Israel from her enemies. Now, in the 29th chapter of Second Chronicles, comes his son, Hezekiah. And there we're told that he was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned for 29 years. And then his mother's name was Abijah. And we're told that Hezekiah did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. You know, that last comment in Second Chronicles there was not said about many other kings. Hezekiah was really only one of three kings who ever sat on the throne of Israel who were pleasing to God. The others were, of course, David and Josiah. But you know, in a way, Hezekiah's case is the most remarkable because of who his father was, that he was one of the most wicked kings of Israel. In fact, Ahaz was so disesteemed that when he died, he was not even buried in the sepulcher. And then we see when Hezekiah finally became king, he was like a man on a mission. His first priority as king was to make things right with God. This promptness and focus on the Lord is something that made him special, an extraordinary king of Israel. Let's start reading in 2 Chronicles 29.3. It says, He in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. And he said unto them, Hear ye, hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth this filthiness out of the holy place. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord, God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, that ye may minister unto him and bring and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. You know, it's hard to believe that Hezekiah could do these good things given who his father was and the deplorable spiritual conditions that he must have faced as he was growing up. You wonder how could he be so different, so intent on doing the Lord's will when the around him were so bad. I think you've all heard the phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> well, here was an apple that didn't even seem to be part of the same tree as his natural father. 
that the scripture actually calls him the son of David because of his faith association. We all know that the influence we have as we're growing up is very important as to who we become as we become adults. In reprint 3462, Brother Russell suggests that it's a little unnatural, unusual, for Hezekiah's mother to be mentioned in the introduction of his life. And possibly this early suggestion of her um, her name early in Hezekiah's reign suggests that she had a lot to do with who Hezekiah became. This is Brother Russell's conclusion. Let's see. He says, what a lesson we have here respecting the power of a mother for good. That was reprint 3462, right? She evidently exercised a molding and controlling influence in the formation of her son's character. The influence of a mother rightly exercised is very highly to be appreciated. Those of you who someday may be parents or who are parents, you have to know the importance of your influence. Our parents have a lot to do with whether the children grow up to be a Hezekiah or even a Hayes. Now, I don't think any of our children are going to grow up to be Ahazes. You see the point, that the parental influence on who the children become is extraordinarily important. An interesting suggestion about this account is that the prophet Isaiah may actually have been Hezekiah's tutor. Now, if that's true, it's not surprising, because Isaiah is the one who gives the Lord's answers to Hezekiah later in our story, and he appears to have been genuinely close to Hezekiah. And so there's another lesson there for us in Isaiah possibly tutoring Hezekiah, and that is to see the wisdom of having our children associate with the brethren as often as possible, to take every opportunity to send our kids to seminars and youth camps or whatever other activities involve the Lord's people, so that in a similar way they can be tutored by brethren. And so if Hezekiah's mother did arrange for Isaiah to be her son's tutor. It was one of the wisest decisions she ever made. And we see how it eventually came to the entire nation of Israel. Well, Hezekiah's work continued. We're told that it took 16 days to get rid of all the filthiness out of the temple that Ahaz had put there. Just curiosity, here's a, a 16th century woodcut from Henry VIII's Bible. I found this on the internet. I just thought I'd put it in here. It depicts Hezekiah burning some of the idols that Ahaz had placed in the temple. Well, let's pick up our reading in uh, verse 20 of Second Chronicles 29. It says, Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bullocks and seven rams and seven lambs and seven he goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary, and for Judah. He commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. And then in verses 22 through 24, the priests offered all these animals. At the end of verse 30, they sing praises with gladness, and they bow their head and worship. And then in verse 31, Hezekiah says, Now that you have consecrated yourself to the Lord, Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all those who were willing brought burnt offerings. And as we read, we say, we find out, my goodness, did they ever bring their offerings? We're told that they brought 70 bullocks, 100 rams, 200 lambs, 6,000 ox, and 3,000 sheep. In fact, there were so many animals brought by the people that there were not enough priests to sacrifice them all. And so the Levites were called on to help. You've got to think of the context of what was happening here. This is an incredible scene because this is the reformation of Israel. All because one man wanted to reinstitute the true worship of God. Of course, he had to find cooperative hearts in the people. But here's an example of what good leadership can accomplish. And I think there's a good lesson here. But the Lord can do wonderful things to those who are willing to commit to the Lord's work, whatever that work might be. That you can be an example to others in leading them to serve the Lord. In the next chapter, we're told that all this work in the temple happened around the time of the Passover. 
But it was all happening so quickly that the priests had not had time to make proper preparations for the Passover, to gather the people in time to observe the Passover at its normal time. And so, after consulting with those who understood the law, it was determined that under these circumstances, it was allowable to observe the Passover on the following month. Once this was decided, Hezekiah sent out a decree to the kingdom along with the Passover decree, stating that when it would be observed. He did an interesting thing. He also sent letters to the Ten Tribe Kingdom of the North, inviting them to share in the Passover. The Ten Tribe Kingdom of Israel was much deeper into idolatry than Judah, although under Ahaz it had become pretty bad too. Many of the Israelites in the north had already been carried away captive into Assyria. And so the northern tribes had been decimated by their enemies. Remember the division of the northern tribes from the southern tribes just after the days of Solomon. There was a, these were two separate nations. Hezekiah's letter to the northern tribe kingdom is given in 2 Chronicles 30, 6 through 9. If you get a chance to read that, he basically counsels them to yield themselves to the Lord so that God's wrath would be turned away from them. And from that letter, there was a mixed response. Reading from verse 10, it says, So the posts passed from city, through, city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulon. They laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulon humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, the hand of God was to give them one heart to, the, to do the commandment of the king, princes, by the word of the Lord. Well, apparently there were many who came from the north. Although they had not gone through the proper ritual cleansings, they partook of the Passover. Now, under normal circumstances, that would have met with severe punishments. But we're told that Hezekiah prayed for them. And this is what he said. Hezekiah prayed, The good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. You can see again that Hezekiah had a real determination to rebirth or reestablish the worship of God, to bring all Israel back together. And one of the things that impressed me the most about Hezekiah was his desire here to help the Jews of the north. Now understand the context of this. Some 250 years before Hezekiah, there had been a bitter division between the ten tribe kingdoms of the north and the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. Ever since that time, they had operated as two separate autonomous nations. And like I said before, idolatry was rampant in the north for much longer than it was in Judah. In fact, their relationship as people had deteriorated so much that during the reign of Hezekiah's father Ahaz, northern Israel even formed a union with Syria and attacked Judah. While that was happening, we're told that the Edomites attacked from the southeast and the Philistines hit Judah from the west. So they were surrounded. But the worst part was that the Jews from the north were attacking the Jews. Now, this was brother fighting against brother. It was a deplorable condition that had been reached under Ahaz. And we're told in Second Chronicles 28 that in one day, 120,000 men were slaughtered in Judah, and 200,000 women and children were taken captive. You know, Hezekiah could very easily have harbored bitterness towards his northern brethren, because he was alive when this happened. Don't you think that he would have known some of those 120,000 men? Don't you think that some of, them, some of them would have been his friends and acquaintances? But his thoughts are just the opposite. He wanted them to come back to the Lord for their own blessings, and because it was the right thing to do. And there's an obvious lesson in all this. We've heard it from the words of Jesus. Do good to them that hate you, to those that despitefully use you. Pray for and desire the blessing of your enemies. That's hard to do, isn't it? 
Because when someone is our enemy, there's a natural resistance and desire to see them hurt. You know, but in this case, the lesson for Hezekiah was even more personal. Because these were his fellow Israelites. Like I said, he must have known some of the 120,000 men who were slain. And so he could very easily have felt that these Jews from the north were not worth helping. The Passover instituted by Hezekiah probably the first one that Judah had seen in a long time. Seven-day celebration turned out to be such a blessing that in 2 Chronicles 30, 23, we're told that the whole assembly took counsel together to keep another seven-day feast. In verse 26, it says that there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, there was not the like in Jerusalem. And then in verse 27, it says, Then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to the holy dwelling place, even us. Well, it had been a long time since Israel had prayed as a nation. It had been a long time since their prayers had been heard in heaven. The next chapter tells us that all the people who were present at Jerusalem went out to the cities of Judah and broke down the statues and the groves that they had erected in their idolatry. The spirit of reformation even went up to the north, to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, it says, until they utterly destroyed their idols. Great time, great experience. And when we look at these things that were happening under Hezekiah's good kingship, we have to wonder, is it possible that the Lord intended this to be more than just an interesting Old Testament story? Could there be a kingdom picture in all of this? And of course, I think the answer is yes. I believe that the work of Hezekiah was given as an illustration of the work of the ancient worthies and the kingdom work which follows the inauguration of the New Covenant. In 2 Chronicles 29.10, we read of Hezekiah's desire to make a covenant with the Lord. Remember, it says, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn from away from us. What he was saying that he wanted to renew the law covenant with God. The law had still been there. The Jews kind of knew about it but he had largely been lost sight of. Hezekiah's desire to renew the law pictures, we think, the establishment of the new covenant because it's through the new covenant that the wrath of God will be turned away not just from Israel, from all the world of mankind. When we look at the Reformation of Hezekiah, we see that there was a natural progression. Notice that the first ones to bring their offerings to the Lord were the rulers of Jerusalem. Picturing, we believe, the conversion of Israel. By reestablishing the priesthood and the temple sacrifices, Hezekiah pictures the work of the ancient worthies as they point Israel to the antitypical temple, to the antitypical sacrifices. They're pointing Israel to Jesus, their Messiah, the one who offered the true and lasting ransom sacrifice. The ancient worthies will teach Israel about a new mediator, and because of their acceptance of that fact, their prayers will again be heard in heaven. Picture the conditions of Jerusalem as it was described in Hezekiah's day. Remember we read this. It says there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon there was not the like in Jerusalem. How beautifully that illustrates the joy that Israel will experience once they obey the voice of the ancient worthies and enter the new covenant arrangement and come to understand their personal need for ransom sacrifice. In Hezekiah's Reformation of Israel, we saw a very specific connection between the Reformation and the Passover. And so we see that same point in the kingdom. Before any progress can be made, either by Israel or by mankind, there will be a recognition of our Lord as the one who paid the price of redemption and deliverance. They will come to see Jesus, true Passover lamb. Recently I was talking to one of the brethren who's had quite a bit of discussions with some Orthodox Jews, and I thought this was very interesting. Apparently these Jews don't see a need for a redemptive price being paid. They believe that when we die, our death 
is the price we pay for our sins. But they also believe in the resurrection, but on a different basis. At some point in the future, they will be raised from the grave as an act of God's mercy. The problem with that, of course, is that our resurrection would then be taking back the penalty, and thus the unbalancing of the scales of justice. God's justice will not allow our resurrection without the payment of a corresponding price. What a blessing it will be for Israel when their partial blindness is lifted, and they will see that the lamb's blood that they smeared on their own doorposts was a picture of the spilled blood of Jesus, payment for the sins of mankind. Recognizing that essential truth will bring great understanding. I think we've all studied the Passover. We do that in Chicago just about every year. We know that the Passover itself is a picture of the Gospel Age. Now, notice that in this Reformation of Hezekiah, the Passover was one month later. We think that the fact that it was one month later shows that this is a picture that follows the Gospel Age. As I said, it will be Israel's recognition of Jesus as the antitypical lamb. One of the really wonderful desires of Hezekiah was, again, like I said, his desire to unite all of Israel. This may be a picture of the ancient worthy's desire to unite all fellow Jews under Christ. Or it may show the ancient worthy's desire to bless all the rest of mankind, just as the northern tribes had gone to war against Judah in the time of Ahaz. We've seen the Gentiles do the same thing against their fellow man, against the Jews throughout the ages of the Gospel Age. And it's going to be a remarkable thing for Jews to want to bless the people who persecuted and hated and killed them. As we said, the response to Hezekiah's letters and proclamations were mixed from the north. Many came and shared in the work and the joy of Reformation. Others mocked it. And so too, it's going to be the same way in the early stages of the king. Some will come and share the joys being administered from Jerusalem. Others are just going to mock it. But the result of Hezekiah's work is that the people went out and tore down all their idols and everything associated with idolatry. And that's a wonderful picture of how the kingdom message and the kingdom work will spread throughout the world. The work will begin in Jerusalem those who are able to see the vision and take part in it. And it will spread like wildfire to all the corners of the earth. All the modern day forms of idolatry will be torn down as one by one, one by one, as the knowledge of the Lord spreads. And in that illustration, I'd like to put one more arrow because you got to come to America. <laughs> I think it's going to be awesome when Americans join with Moroccans and Libyans and French and, yes, even the Italians will find a way to get along with everyone. It's going to be one united world under Christ. What a prospect lays before us as we see a united human family worshiping God in the right way. The result of the worship in Jerusalem was that the people brought in their own offerings to the temple. So many animals were brought that the priests couldn't keep up and the Levites had to help. Some of these offerings, if you ever studied Tabernacle Shadows, you see a chapter in there about after atonement day sacrifices. I think that's what these offerings were similar to. And they picture their response from all over the world to the kingdom work. You know, today when we witness, you might be lucky to find one person who's got an interesting ear, interested ear. But the conversion of the world is not going to be like that. It's not going to be one here, one there like it is today. But in the kingdom, there is going to be an overflowing response shown by the multitude of offerings brought to the temple. And I found it interesting that Hezekiah didn't just tell the people what they should do. He led by example. From his own herds, he offered a thousand bullocks and seven thousand sheep. The ancient word is, will be examples of consecrated living, just as Hezekiah himself led the way in the reformation of Israel. 
There's another interesting thing that Hezekiah did to the Israelites. He saw that when the northern Israelites came to the Passover, they had not gone through the proper ritual cleansings that were required because of their recent idolatry and their access into the temple. And so they celebrated unclean. And their participation in the Passover really was a violation of the law. And like we said earlier, when Hezekiah was informed of this, he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah. Now, antitypically, I think there will be many in the kingdom whose heart's desire is going to be to know the Lord, and yet they will be so backwards in their understanding of how to serve the Lord, how to properly approach them, that they're going to make mistakes. But here we see the, a picture of the ancient worthies showing them that God will forgive their mistakes. They will explain the legality of forgiveness and how the work of Jesus and the church as the mediator operates in that age. Perfection will not be required. The heart intent will be looked at. Isn't it amazing that God overlooked a violation of the law as he did here? On other occasions, he was so strict that he needed out instant death when someone uh, broke a law. Now God's forgiveness in this case shows us that even in the exactness of the law, heart intent was considered. So when one person violated the law, the punishment was swift and severe. But someone with a heart, sincere heart, when they made a mistake against the law, there was room for forgiveness. In 2 Chronicles 31, 5 and 6, we see an amazing spirit of generosity and devotion upon the people. After being instructed to bring their tithes, we're told that the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey. And of all the increase of the fields, and tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. They also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep, and the tithe of holy things which are consecrated unto the Lord God, and laid them by heaps. In fact, there were so many tithes brought in that eventually Hezekiah questioned the priests and Levites whether they were taking their share, and they said that they had. It's just that the people brought in so many tithes that special store chambers had to be built just to hold them all. What a lesson of free will giving this teaches. A lesson that the whole world will learn so much so that they will give to the Lord in abundance. The world will finally come to learn that you receive by giving, not by hoarding for yourself. The human spirit is shown here to become generous. You know we have an abundant earth. Even today our earth can produce enough food to feed every poor and hungry person in the world. But the difference is greed. And when greed is taken away from man's hearts, wealth will be enough for everyone. Food and shelter and plenty, it's there. And I have to tell you, brethren, the time when the Lord will take first place in the hearts of men and women. When the great artists, the great musicians, the great craftsmen, when every person will ask, what can I give to the Lord for all his goodness towards me? What best gift can I give to show my appreciation for the kingdom, for the resurrection, for the blessings of life, for the goodness of the earth, the love of the human family, and for the love of God and His Son? That is going to be a pivotal point in human history when mankind's continual offering to God will be so abundant in wit. Let's look at one more scripture to wrap up this section. This is 2 Chronicles 31, 20 and 21. And note in the spirit of Hezekiah, the spirit that we anticipate in the ancient worthy. It says, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did that which was good, right, and true before the Lord his God. And every work which he began in the service of the house of God in law and in commandment, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. Brethren, that's the spirit of consecration. Do it with your heart. Do good and right and be true. You do that. 
the Lord will prosper you, as he will prosper the work of the ancient worthies in the coming kingdom. Well, the next chapter of the story takes a very interesting turn. We come back now to the story of Sennacherib. And now we see the testing of Hezekiah along very different lines. Let's begin reading uh, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 1. Because after these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and besieged the fortified cities and thought to break into them for himself. Now that might be a little misleading. It sounds like Sennacherib came just after the reforms of Hezekiah. Sennacherib actually came against Jerusalem in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign. So this was some 13 years after the reformation of Judah. And it in the following verses of chapter 32, we see Hezekiah making preparations for war. And he, we're told that he shut up all the water supplies so that the Assyrian army would have a more difficult time. And for any of you who have been to Israel, and maybe you walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. This was the time that he built the tunnel so that Jerusalem's water supply would be, which originated outside the walls of Jerusalem, could be brought within the wall through this tunnel. In verse 5, the walls of Jerusalem were built up and fortified, and many weapons of war were prepared. Hezekiah was also aware that the people would need encouragement, that this was going to be a fearful time for them. At the end of 2 Chronicles 32.6, it says, Hezekiah spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for the multitude that is with him, for there is more for us and with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Well, Hezekiah knew the psychological implications of war. He knew that fear was a powerful emotion. Fear, fear could be paralyzing. And when it paralyzes the Lord's people, the reason is usually because they do not see the invisible hand of the Lord in the experience. All they can see is the visible hand. And we've seen that fear has been an, a weapon of the adversary used for thousands of years now. Here we see it being used against fear and intimidation for prominent weapons being used by Sennacherib. If we turn to the account in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19, we have a more detailed account of this psychological battle that began before any arms were taken up against Jerusalem. When Sennacherib's army arrived at Jerusalem, he sent out three emissaries to intimidate and threaten Hezekiah and Judah. As the three men approached the walls of Jerusalem, Hezekiah sent three of his own men out to meet them and talk to them. Now this is what Rabshakeh, who was one of the Assyrian emissaries, said to Hezekiah's men. He said, Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and kiss it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. But if ye say unto me, We trust the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away, and it said to Judah and Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Now, these were obviously lies. As the three Hebrew men stood before Rabshakeh, they looked out over this ocean of Assyrian soldiers that were before them. They were intimidated. And they knew the men on the walls behind them just as afraid. In fact, the first thing they say in response to Rabshakeh was, Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And talk not with us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the walls. And these men were not negotiators, were they? That's all that Rabshakeh needed to hear. He knew his fear was working. So instead of changing languages, he shouts in Hebrew so that all the men of Judah could clearly hear him. His words start in 2 Kings 18.28. You can just feel the power in his words. 
He says, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men who sit on the wall? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Syria. Let not Hezekiah deceive you. He shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered in the hand of Syria. And then he goes on in the rest of the chapter, and he lists all the areas that Assyria had conquered, and how none of the gods of those lands had saved their people. This was an intimidating and overwhelming display of intimidation. Who could not deny the power of Assyria? Who could argue against the military conquests all around them? Jerusalem was like an island. Hezekiah called it a remnant. Fighting the Assyrians just didn't seem to be the logical thing to do. Hezekiah's men came back into the city, came to the Jerusalem, and they rent their clothes. They were terrified. Hezekiah himself rents his clothes and he puts on sackcloth, which is a symbol of mourning. He goes into the temple to pray to the Lord. He sent word to Isaiah the prophet, who sent word back to him that he shouldn't fear the blasphemous words of the Assyrians, that the Lord would deliver them. But this onslaught of intimidating words continued. In 2 Kings 19, 10-13, Rabshakeh sent a letter to Hezekiah with similar boasting and fearful words. Hezekiah then took the letter into the temple and laid it before the Lord. It's one of the most famous incidences in the Old Testament. Brethren, here is an honest picture of a man who dearly wanted to do the Lord's will, was terrified by his enemies. Here we see a real-life struggle of faith, struggling against human fear. And I guess it's an obvious statement, but Hezekiah did the right thing. He was honest. He told the Lord how much he feared the enemy. And he sought the Lord's help and guidance. And again, the Lord sent word through Isaiah. Hezekiah had been heard, and that God would deliver Jerusalem. At the end of verse 28, God said that he would put hooks in Sennacherib's nose and a bridle in his lips and lead him back to where he had come from. The account then goes on to tell us that the angel of the Lord slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. I guess there, there can be no joy in that amount of death. But can you imagine the feeling in the hearts of the Hebrew men? They got up the next morning and looked over the walls of Jerusalem and saw what the Lord had done for them. It was the joy of deliverance it was knowing that they would live. It was knowing that God was true to his word. In Second Chronicles 32, 21, it says that when Sennacherib saw what had happened, he returned with shame to his own land. Quite a contrast to those boasting words of Rabshakeh. Also, these honest details we get from the scriptures show us the emptiness of Sennacherib's spin on history when he recorded he had had Hezekiah like a caged bird in Jerusalem. The truth is that all his boasting words were empty words. His mighty army did not even put one scratch on the walls of Jerusalem because it was God's city. And in spite of the fear that pressed down upon them, those within it came to believe in God's might. And so the lesson is faith. Always be the correct response to any attack to any trial, to any experience, no matter how overwhelming or impossible the odds might seem, or how strongly fear may be pressing down upon us. Heaven, it's not wrong to be afraid of something. It's wrong when we don't take that fear to God. In looking at this story, we again ask the question, could this experience be symbolic of a future event? And we see that there are at least a, a couple of possibilities. The first is in relation to Israel's deliverance during Jacob's trouble. There certainly are similarities. We're told that in Jacob's trouble, only a remnant will be left. And they will be attacked from the north. Well, Assyria is north of Israel. 
And Hezekiah called Jerusalem a remnant of Israel. In Jacob's trouble, God says that he will fight for them as in the days of old. Well, here we have in Hezekiah one of those days of old experiences of God miraculously. So that's one possibility that this is symbolic of Jacob's trouble. But there's another possibility that I like even better. And the reason is because of the previous picture we saw in the reforming work of Hezekiah and how it pictured the kingdom work of the ancient worthies. Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem, he said, happened years later after the restitution work of Hezekiah had prospered in the land. And because of that time connection, we would say that the attack of Assyria might better picture the little season that's at the end of the millennium. Remember the description of the little season in Revelation. In Revelation 20, verse 8, we read that Satan shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Isn't that what Sennacherib tried to do? He tried to deceive the people into believing that Hezekiah was lying to them, that in fact the only way for them to sit under their own vine and fig tree make an and offer him gifts. He said that he would then lead them out of Israel into a land of milk and honey where they would live and not die. That's the prospect of what Satan is going to do in the little season. Try to deceive mankind that he will be their source of blessing. And then in Revelation 20 verses 9 and 10, it says that in the little season, Satan's host come past the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Well, Sennacherib had also encompassed Jerusalem, and in both cases we see the miraculous destruction of Jerusalem's enemies. No one can stand against the Lord. No one can intimidate the Lord. No one can do those things to anyone who truly believes in his strength and might. Following that final deliverance, we read of the rich future that lies ahead of the world of mankind after the little season. This is Ephesians 2, 7. It says, Thus he shows for all the ages to come the tremendous generosity of the grace and kindness he has expressed towards us in Jesus Christ. Life is a gift from God. Deliverance from oppressive enemies is a special grace that he gives. It was for Hezekiah in ancient Israel, and it will be for all the faithful and willing of our race, as they are someday delivered from the great oppressor, Satan himself. Well, the story of Hezekiah doesn't end here. I know we're running out of time, but we'll cover this quickly. In 2 Kings 20, we find out that while all this was happening with Sennacherib, Hezekiah became very sick with a severe boil. And in his sickness, Isaiah comes to him and tells him that he should get his house in order because this was a sickness unto death. And then you might remember that Hezekiah prayed with tears to the Lord. And again, his prayer was heard. In 2 Kings 20, verse 6, God assures Hezekiah that he would extend his life by 15 years. And Hezekiah asked for a sign that that would happen. And as you probably know, he asked that the sign would be that the sun would go back 10 degrees. Let's read that from the account in Isaiah. This is Isaiah 38, verse 18. He says, Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz 10 degrees backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. You know, a, a skeptic, a non-believer might read that and look at that verse and say, no, that's impossible. Now, now we know the Bible is fairy tales. For the sun to go back 10 degrees, the, the earth would have to stop its rotation and actually reverse itself. It would violate all the laws of nature and physics, and it would destroy every living thing on the earth. But you know, there is a scientific explanation for this. If you get a chance, get a good encyclopedia like Britannica. And look up the word halo. In there you'll find that halos are often formed around the sun by ice crystals in the atmosphere. 
And these crystals act as prisms to refract or refract or bend the light of the sun, similar to a rainbow. Now, let me just give you a simple explanation because there's a very technical explanation I couldn't understand. I read that there are, um, the halos can form in different configurations around the sun. First, there can be a circle around the sun called the inner halo. And then there can also be a larger halo that circles the sun at 90 degrees from the inner halo. It's this luminous ring that follows the horizon of the Earth. You can actually have a vertical and a horizontal halo at the same time, though it's very rare. On this horizontal halo, there can be bright colored spots that are the reflections of the sun. Where the two halos intersect, the image of the sun can be very bright, as bright as the sun itself. Uh, scientists call these mock suns, or parhelia. Par meaning and, and helia, of course, meaning sun. These are additional suns. Now, the vernacular for this is sun dogs. If you get on the internet and you just look up the word sun dogs, you'll see some pictures of this. In a certain formation of ice crystals, you can actually see three equally bright suns in the sky appearing in a row. Now, to make the sun dial go back 10 degrees, all the Lord would have to do was to form these halos and mock suns and then bring a dark cloud cover to hide the two most advanced suns. As the clouds moved in, the shadow of the sun dial would actually go backwards. Now that's really what the account in 2 Kings 20.11 tells us. It says that he brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards. Amazing. There's an explanation for what could have happened in Hezekiah's day. But the question is, is does the scientific explanation minimize the miracle? And the answer is no, of course, not at all, because miracles are just as impressive because of their timing and the circumstances in which they're formed. God often uses natural means to create a miracle. But having them occur at the exact moment shows his mastery and control of everything we know. Now here is an actual photograph of the Fox Suns taken in Utah in 2003. You can see the faint line of the halo there, but look at how bright the mock suns are. Almost as bright as the sun itself. Here's another picture of just one of the mock suns taken uh, in British Columbia in 2002. That is not the real sun. That's the parhelia. Now, again, we ask, is there a picture here? And I'm not sure that there is, but if there is, this moving back of, this, of the shadow 10 degrees was to give Hezekiah proof that God would keep his promise of extending his life. Now, this extension of his life might illustrate, we believe, the change of nature from human to spirit being that Brother Russell suggests for the ancient worthies. In a sense, it would be giving, like giving them a new life if that's what the Lord intended here. Now, Hezekiah's last words are given to us in Isaiah 38, 19. Hezekiah said, It is the living who give thanks to thee as I do today. A father tells a son about thy faithfulness. The Lord will surely save me. So we will play my songs on stringed instruments all the days of our life at the house of the Lord. Now, in these last words of Hezekiah, we're given an interesting clue that may explain something we find in the book of Psalms. Notice that he said, we will play my songs. And the question is, well, what songs could he be referring to? We won't take time to get into this. I think I have a handout of this somewhere. If you would like a copy, just send me an email. Um, but just to mention that in the book of Psalms, there are 15 Psalms that are titled A Song of Degrees. They consist of Psalms 120 through 134. You've probably seen these subtitles in your Bible and, and wondered what in the world they mean. Well, the subtitle should actually read this, a song of the degrees, showing that the compiler had something very specific in mind. Now, if any of you have the Companion Bible, in the appendix, in the rear, there's a, a bunch of appendixes. 
in Appendix 67, the thought is presented that these 15 chapters correspond to the 15 years that Hezekiah's life was extended. And it contends that these are the chapters that Hezekiah was referring to when he said that they would sing his songs. Now, he didn't write these chapters. They were actually written by David and Solomon, but he compiled them into a certain form as a memorial of the Lord's deliverance of Jerusalem and the extension of his own life. The word for degrees in these subtitles is the same Hebrew word for the ten degrees that the shadow went back on the sundial. And in these 15 chapters, just as a quick overview, there are three repetitive themes. The 15 chapters are divided into five sets of three chapters each. And the three themes follow each of the three chapter divisions. The first theme is distress from the deceit and scorning of others. The second is trust in the Lord expressed by God's people. And the third theme is the blessings and peace that come to his people as a result of their trust. Stress, trust, blessings, and peace. That's, of course, a universal theme that all the Lord's people experience at one time or another in their lives. It was also the special experience of Hezekiah. And so you can see that these chapters had a deeply personal meaning to him to stress at the onslaught of Sennacherib, trust in the Lord that they would be delivered, and the blessings and peace that come they actually were delivered. I'll just briefly listen to what it says in one of these psalms, and you'll see the direct reflection of Hezekiah's own experience. This is Psalms 124, verses 6 to 8. It said, Blessed be the Lord, who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fathers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. So this passage makes a clear allusion to Sennacherib's contention that Hezekiah was a caged bird. But the reality of what Sennacherib didn't say is that the Lord opened the cage and released his people. The lesson in all of this is that just as in the days of, of old, there is no enemy of the Lord's people who can really harm them in any way there's no fowler, fowler who can cage them up, because our Lord is the same Lord, the one who made heaven and earth, and he devotes himself to his faithful people. What a lesson of faith experiences of King Hezekiah.